Cheers. All right, I'll hand you over to Shane. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll let you introduce the, the panelists. No problem. Thank you. Okay, folks. Um, we're here. Uh, you all still awake? It's been a long day, I trust. Um, not to discomfort uh, feeling in, in this nice theatre. It's not too bad, I suspect. Um, I can tell you, though, it's a lot sunnier outside, so uh, we'll try and wrap this up on time for you. Um, we have three very amazing panellists today, and uh, I have to say, just being outside with them for a few moments, um, they have, I would say, very strong opinions about uh, communication of science, in particular in the fields of uh, the medical and health sciences, where we all have so much at stake. So let me introduce, I'm sure if they're in the right order for me, but um, that's okay. On, my, on your far right is Associate Professor Megan Munsey, and Megan is the Head of Ethics, Education, Law and Community Awareness Unit at Stem Cells Australia, and I'll ask Megan to say a few words in a few moments about herself and her work. Uh, in the middle is Professor Martin Delaticki. Uh, Martin is the Director of the Bruce Lefroy Centre for Genetic Health Research out at the Austin Health Centre in... Um, what's the suburb? So, um, it, Murdoch is at Parkville, at, at, at the Children's Hill. Hospital, and um, also at the Austin, which oh, is in Heidelberg. Heidelberg, yep. Um, and to my left, uh, and your, your far left, um, is Melanie Thompson. And Melanie's a biomedical researcher in the School of Medical uh, Medicine at Deakin University in Geelong. She's a prolific tweeter, apparently, which I am not, so I don't know about this fact. I didn't um, realise I was prolific. Apparently prolific. Apparently I, am. Um, I should cut back. I, I still hold the amazing credit that I have uh, more more followers than tweets. Apparently that means something <laughs> insulting. Um, she works in the frontiers of microbiology and has looked at um, whether Twitter or not actually helps communication and I understand has had a particularly interesting run in the use of crowdfunding to actually support her research. So. We might start with you, Megan. I'll just ask you to give a minute on what you do um, with regards to stem cells and why communication is important for you. Okay, so um, so I work at Stem Cells Australia, which is an Australian Research Council funded initiative. And predominantly the initiative is to fund basic research, to look at how stem cells are grown, how to grow them better, how we can get the cells from stem cells in a usable uh, manner. So. I'm a stem cell biologist myself, but I took a, 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 a sort of career a change kind of about 10 years ago because I saw this real need to have a, a role in contextualising what we were doing in the lab. And this was particularly in relation to the legislation that was to enable stem cell research using human embryos. So I've had a long interest in kind of managing community expectation and, and really trying not to overhype the stem cell sector, which is what we've seen. And I, I feel 10 years on, I spend a lot of my time now, I suppose, um, managing that heightened expectation and what we're seeing more and more of is the frustration of people who've heard about stem cells, who are frustrated that we aren't delivering on the promise and uh, really taking matters into their own hands and pursuing treatments abroad and even here that are unproven. And uh, I think that has you know, severe consequences both to potentially to their health uh, and, and also to the sector. So I suppose that's what I'm, I'm kind of obsessed about at the moment, as I was telling you earlier. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Now, Martin, you're out there at um, one of the, I guess, the, the coalface, really, of um, where genetics and, and health hit the road. Tell us a bit more about what you do and why communication is so important for your work. So um, I'm a clinical geneticist, so uh, half of my time is spent talking to people with genetic conditions, at risk of genetic conditions, abnormal results on prenatal testing and, and such like. So communication is, I think, absolutely <laughs> very important uh, on the one-to-one -one, um, basis there. Uh, I spend considerable time at talk talking to people about why I don't think they should spend $50,000 on stem cell treatments in various countries. Uh, and then I think my other role is in, in uh, medical research and uh, for all the reasons that Peter was just talking about, the incredible importance of communicating what you do to the main stakeholders, so the diseases you work on, but the general community. I'm very interested in the ethics of genetics and, uh, and that that's another area where communication is, is absolutely cru crucial. Mm. I think it's fair to say that when, when we use the word communication, 
We, um, we use it to cover many, many things, and even hearing the first two of you, um, we're covering a lot of ground there, communication with patients, communication with parents of patients, with family members of patients, with, with other doctors, with researchers, um, with the general community, with policy makers. It, it is an extremely broad, broad church we're talking about. Um, Melanie, your um, work has been partly crowdfunded. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, I work at Deakin in the medical school. I'm just, I've only been there um, just over two and a half years after coming back from 12 years in the UK. Um, I'm an early career researcher. I only got my PhD in 2009. So, you know, I'm not in, in the scene, as it were. I'm not one of the sort of in crowd here in Australia. I've been away and, you know, I've come back and I don't really have a patron to help me through the sort of grant minefield. So I sort of just said, well, why bother, really? Let's do something else. And uh, Deacon, uh, Kate, they sent around an email in February, I think it was, saying, hi, does anyone have some sort of crazy idea they think that they could get crowdfunding for, for a research project? And I went, ha, got just the thing. And um, the project that I did on Possible, it was the first time Possible had done a research-based uh, projects. Usually they do media and sort of film festival funding and things like that. So it was, and it, we, they were in partnership with Deakin to do this, to do this Research My World um, uh, concept. And we basically were the guinea pigs. <coughs> we were all sort of just working it out as we went along, but it was quite good. And my concept was uh, called uh, Mighty Maggots versus, versus the flesh-eating bacteria, or flesh non bug mm -hmm. as I called it. And basically it was to, look, to fund a clinical trial to test medical maggots as a debridement treatment for uh, uh, the Bansdale ulcer, which is a problem down in, in the Bellarine Peninsula near Geelong. And so most people lost sight of the sort of actual microbiology of it. it the mighty maggots just became their own stars of the show, really. You just can't compete with maggots when you're, on, when you're talking about them. They steal all of the limelight. Uh, so it just ended up being sort of mighty maggots. And people, we had 129 donors that gave us uh, almost ten thousand uh, dollars through the campaign, which was very nice. But I, as again, the communication, we, this, the possible people sort of said, "Oh, you just need to do twenty minutes on Twitter a day, and you'll get your ten grand. You'll be fine." Uh, no, <laughs> that wasn't quite the case. Uh, you'd, I had to do a whole lot of uh, community engagement as well, like in real life, because my actual stakeholders were sort of retired people that live in Ocean Grove that don't use the internet. Uh, so. Uh, I went to Rotary clubs, I went to Probus clubs, I did school visits, everything. Um, and so you need to do a combination of all the different types. So, so give us an idea, you know, as someone who works in a university, you do a certain type of communication yeah. in your day-to-day -day job. Eliciting crowdfunding seems like a completely different arena in terms of how you would communicate the information. How, how yeah. did you go about that for getting people to fund putting maggots into people's flesh? Yeah, I mean, you do. You had to do a little video saying what you were doing, and I had a couple of uh, soft toys, one of which looked a bit dodgy, and I didn't bring it today because I sometimes bring it, but it tends to again steal the show. But uh, uh, you do a little video, and we were a bit sort of stilted, you know, as scientists are. We weren't very good, myself and Michelle Harvey, my partner, that did it. Um, but by the end of the time, we were doing all sorts of. Um, Facebook videos of maggot racing and all sorts of things. You just have to make it fun and you have to give rewards that are actually unique and that money can't buy. And we were giving out maggot art as the rewards. And so people, and people have framed their maggot art. People send me pictures on Twitter of the frames on, and they've gone to like proper frame shops to buy, get it mounted. And I'm like, it's maggot art. I thought you'd stick it on the fridge with a magnet and then it'd fall off after a couple of weeks and you'd throw it in the bin. I mean, that's the sort of <laughs> level at which I thought that they... But no, some people revere their maggot art. It's quite, it became quite cult-like. It was quite hmm. scary. It's a, it's a brave new world. Um, now, Martin, uh, with regards to this brave new world we're in, we, we have different options these days, or we did until earlier this week, I think, where the idea of getting our genome sequenced um, is now in the realm of pretty much everyone uh, in the Western world, at, at least, where we can you know, order these kits online and have our genome and, and information associated with that sent out to us for under $100. And just a decade ago, it would have seemed impossible that we can now do it. What does this mean in terms of our obligations for communication with the people involved in that and those who may interact with them as well? 
So I think, you know, genetics is advancing at an extraordinary rate. And really, you know, I've been working in genetics for 20 years and it's never been like this where almost week to week you're out of date, people are asking you about things that didn't exist two weeks ago. Uh, the options for people to have testing is, is quite extraordinary. Um, what you're talking about for $99 is 23andMe or similar companies. And that's not a whole genome sequencing. That's uh, looking for a number of specific mutations and uh, alterations that predispose to very important um, factors in people's lives, such as earwax uh, consistency, um, <laughs> which is fun. But, but the serious side is that they test uh, for the BRCA mutations that are common in uh, Jewish people. Uh, and if you've got one of those mutations, uh, your risk of breast cancer is severely increased. Your risk of ovarian cancer is severely increased. Mm -hmm. and, and then many different things in between. And I mean, I think that their responsibility is A, to get the testing right, and that's what the FDA have shut them down for because they're um, concerned about their uh, processes between getting the sample or even people sending the sample through to giving a result based on what arrives in the lab rather than the, the testing itself. Uh, then their responsibility is to explain all of these um, 200 and something genes that they look at and what they all mean. Uh, and then the responsibility is what, what negativity can happen for people's lives. Obviously there's hopefully some positive things, but also could this cause harm? And I think that um, learning your earwax consistency is unlikely to cause harm, but uh, opening an envelope and finding out that, that you know there's a 60% a, a chance of breast cancer, 40% chance of ovarian cancer, and the recommended uh, preventive measures for ovarian cancer is to have ovaries removed, which is not an insignificant mm. um, intervention. Um, finding out that way you know, there's pros and cons. It, you could argue it's better to find out that way than not at all, but but perhaps better to find out after having a bit of counselling in the first place. Mm. Uh, I, I want to move on to what our obligations are often as scientists to speak up against those of other scientists and other researchers and others who are not even in the fields uh, when they put out information. I want to give you a quick example. Many of you would be aware that in 2009 there was quite a devastating earthquake in L'Aquila in Italy. And since that time, um, when 309 odd people died, there has been an ongoing court case um, for six seismologists and one government bureaucrat who uh, met uh, after a, a four shock, um, which was only about a four on the Richter scale, they met and they decided that the risk was low. Now, of course, the six scientists rightfully uh, made it very clear that they could not predict whether or not there would be an earthquake. Seismology is not that point. Unfortunately, the bureaucrat involved um, went out and literally told people to go home and have a glass of wine. In fact, he even gave them the vintage and type of wine they should be drinking. He was that specific. Now, as a result of that, um, the, of the 309 people who died, some 25 of them have been attributed directly to those statements. Um, these are people who literally stayed in their homes and didn't even evacuate to the street because of the information they were given. Those seven individuals have been tried and convicted of manslaughter in Italy, and um, the case is currently now up for review. And so the original judge who charged them is now out of the game and another a set of uh, judges, three judges, is now looking at the case again. This is a very interesting example, though, because the one thing that didn't happen um, was that when the bureaucrat spoke up, the six seismologists didn't correct him. So although the scientists in this case could very rightfully say, we did not give misinformation to the public, um, they also did not correct misinformation when given to the public on their field. And Megan, I wanted to ask you with regards to stem cells in particular, I mean, what is happening there? What, what are some of the worst examples you've seen of this happening and what is the obligation on us to do something to stop that? 
So um, I, I think there is an enormous obligation on us to speak out. The problem is where and when. And that's the great challenge and I think the, the, the nuanced issue. And I don't know if I have exactly the right answer, but the, the example I'd like to give, I, I think, it carries on from that analogy of the earthquake. This is uh, back to what I was mentioning before about unproven treatments. So there's no doubt that stem cells will have a role in, in future medicines. There are a lot of clinical trials underway. It's not going to be a silver bullet to be able to fix everything. And yet many of these clinics are portraying, promoting, marketing that kind of magic solution. What we've seen for a long time is clinics overseas. And as Martin mentioned, they charge between 10, 60, 100,000 for treatment. It was quite shocking to me to find out two years ago that treatments are often are offered here in Australia. And I took a call from a, a gentleman whose wife had MS. And he said, oh, look, I, my wife's just come back from a consultation with a plastic, with a cosmetic surgeon in Sydney who's offered her treatment for her MS. Is this dodgy? And I said, oh, and I gave him the literature that we have prepared around overseas tourism, stem cell tourism, and said, perhaps you'd like to re read this. There are no proven treatments. Go and see somebody who's get a second opinion, basically. And anyway, I reported to the, the Therapeutic Goods Administration because I thought this was very concerning. And they said, well, don't you know about this regu regulation exemption, excluded goods order? And this, this order literally allows for uh, patient, for Australian doctors to provide Australian patients with treatment using their own cells. And how to handle this has been something that's consumed a group of us uh, for a while now, for two years, mm. effectively. We've gone, we've decided not to make it a a media issue because we're very concerned about how it would be portrayed. We've can, tried to... Can you to speak to that just for a moment, Damien? Why, why wouldn't you? I mean, wh what do you think would happen if you The first thing, so, the so I have tried a mm. few people um, that I kind of have a little bit more faith in who I know have more time, let's say, to deal with the issue. And uh, everybody says, okay, where's the disgruntled patient? Preferably with a, some kind of catastrophic um, consequence from this terrible treatment, Megan. And I said, well... I can't, I can't deliver you. And, off, and actually I had media people to refer to them as talent. Can you mm. give me the talent? Yep. <sighs> and so I take a deep breath and say, well, look, no, I talked, because I, I should also mention um, my academic research now is working in sociology where we're interviewing people who've gone overseas and not to make fun or denigrate their experience, but actually to document their experience and to try to understand the, motiva the motivation behind their trip. It's often not just pure desperation. So we're trying to look at this issue. So I do talk to a lot of people in this circumstance, and I don't feel ethic that it's ethical that I can just deliver them on a platter for media. So anyway, so that's sort of something that, that bothers me. The other issue about engaging the media too early on this is that I know I have met people who stood up in public forums and said, but this same doctor in Sydney, he's saved my life. He's wonderful. He's finally, I have found someone who will help me. Now, if you get that, you know, we will look, it'll divide the scientific medical community. There'll be those who say, this is outrageous, it's unprofessional, it's unethical. They are pariahs, these mm -hmm. doctors who are providing treatment. And then you'll have the patient saying, but, but those people are stopping this life, the life-saving treatment. So what we've been trying to do is not take it into the, into the uh, public arena just yet. We've been trying to work with the regulators because we thought it was really quite a simple thing. I understand when you introduced this legislation back in 2011, perhaps you didn't understand the consequences of this excluded goods order. Why don't we just tighten it? Why don't we just change some of the wording, introduce the word uh, homologous use, which means same, same. So taking fat to put back into fat or taking bone to put back into bone. So restricting the, this enormous loophole that's there at the moment. And also introducing it as a requirement that the cells have to be manufactured in an accredited laboratory because that will then stop these doctors uh, who are operating in their suburban consultation. There's one in particular, his wife does a cell prep. Um, so uh, what, just, to, just to, to finish off, where we're at is have, we've had 18 months of extraordinary, extraordinary frustration. We've had sympathetic reception from the regulators, but until we have a catastrophic event, they aren't able to do much. So it's not in the remit of TGA, it's not seen as a, a manufactured good, so they push us over to a medical issue through, through uh, the new um, Australian Health Practitioners Regulatory Agency and the medical boards. But that can only, they can only be triggered if there's a patient to complain. 
So at the moment, we, we, we're basically playing whack-a-mole. We're keeping a list. We've gone from one clinician to now uh, 27. Mm. And, and, um, and, and I think it's now time, we are now working with the ABC to try to raise this issue in the public arena. But again, it hasn't gone to air yet mm. because they are still ringing, asking for the talent. Mm. I've seen 20 years of broadcasting on Triple R. I've never referred to a researcher as the talent. Um, no, 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 this is a patient. Oh, a patient. Talent. That's even worse. Um, <laughs> with, with researchers coming in, I find that uh, it's kind of, uh, it can be a bad luck charm if you use the word talent before they get there <laughs> on occasion. Um, rarely. Now, Martin, at the, at the clinic, um, you have a lot of patients coming in. What, what sort of level of knowledge do they have in terms of the way the system works? You know, we, we use the word health literacy quite um, inappropriately, I think, sometimes. That, that means I know where my heart is relative to my kidney, but in terms of how these processes work, what's appropriate, the, the, um, the rules and regulations in place, um, that health literacy appears to be quite low. Yeah, I think um, it, it varies between you know, incredibly low through to remarkably high. Um, I had a patient whose wife diagnosed him with an incredibly rare uh, cancer predisposition syndrome, Berthog Dubé syndrome, which I hadn't even heard of myself until a couple of years ago. So I think that's a remarkable use of the internet, and she was quite correct. And uh, and uh, I have lauded her on numerous occasions for, for for doing that. But at the other end, I think is is where a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing, and I think that's the sort of thing you're alluding to. With well, uh, you know, if we take these cells and inject them into the muscle that will improve muscle and and it's not illogical but it just might be right and it might be harmful and so I've definitely much more in recent years had to talk through things with people because they've read things and, and added one and one and made three and, and that can be very hard to to undo and, and you know I, I'm thinking of a one particular situation where there's a child involved who I think is suffering because of of that um, parental thought process, and it's very difficult to undo. Mm. Mel, you, you must um, see this great contrast between colleagues publishing in the, you know, um, New England Journal of Medicine and and Twitter. Um, at what point do we need to be bringing the public in? I mean, where, where do where do you see them sitting? I mean, is is Twitter the new way you feel to? communicate these sorts of issues or is it inadequate because of its well, length constrictions? It is very um, restrictive in that way, but you, if you use it in, in, collab, in, sort of in concert with other forms of um, social media such as blogs or long form, you know, sort of lo the long form uh, blogs and maybe even Facebook, I mean having a mm. Facebook page and we did that during the campaign. Uh, but it's interesting listening to these guys because I, I come at it from a child of a mother with autism, and I get a lot of. You go, if you go on any of these sort of autism parental forums, you will get the sort of crazies that think that if you give your your, your kids a fecal transplant, that will solve their autism problem. Mm. And uh, it's just, and I've I've had stand up arguments in the car park in the primary school with people who are like uh, saying to me, "Oh, I suppose you think the naturopathy is a waste of time for him as well." And I'm like, "If it makes you feel better, as long as it doesn't harm him," but you know that uh, it can be quite restrictive and I think you definitely do get, there is, there can be miscommunication on Twitter and, but you do, it's interesting because you've got, it, because it's social, you have a group of people and, you know, most of the people that I follow on Twitter and that follow me are usually other scientists, so it's actually a big scientific network and I know that um, my good friend Dave Hawkes from the Flory, he's, he's quite into the Stop the AVN movement which is the um, aforementioned, uh, now not named the Australian Vaccination Network anymore because they've been banned from using that name, uh, the anti-vaccination network, I think we like to call them. But uh, there's a lot of work on that, that there's a lot of people on Twitter that actually put out their the sort of scientific versions and look at, you know, basically putting the sort of other side of the story compared to the sort of misinformation that gets out there to try and fight fight in the same space, which is basically social media and Google and forums and things like that. So you actually have to, um, 
you know, you have to engage in those spaces because those the, pe the people that are getting their information or misinformation are getting them from the same limited, you know, social media platforms. Mm -hmm. And so I think it behooves scientists and researchers and science communicators to actually get into those platforms so that they can try and have a, uh, you know, engage at least with the people. I mean, sometimes they're just crazies and you just have to block them. But, you know, mm. if you can get some sort of engagement with them and say, look, here, read this link or read this paper or something, you know, you can get, you can actually flick them the real science. You know, you can actually send them PDFs if they need to, if you get their email address. Mm. Because they don't often have access. If it's not open access, they can't get access to yeah. that. I, I just wanted to do, uh, completely agree, and, and and I use Twitter a lot, and not just to um, to I keep I, I use it to to watch, um, and, I, and I also subscribe to a couple of newsletters to watch, um, and I find that quite interesting. But I also use it to connect with my international colleagues. So often a story will break in the states or in 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 Europe, and I will be able to retweet what they've tweeted or put it in Australian context. And equally, they've just started to do the same thing with me. Yeah. So when I've been tweeting some things, they have too. And, and one of the, the, the best sort of tools in our little toolkit recently was a story in Scientific American that wasn't a very catastrophic story, but it was very graphic in that a woman had bone fragments grow around her eye following a stem cell facelift in Beverly Hills. And, <laughs> and anyway, it, caught, it was an easy thing to, to tweet about. There was a link to a publicly... Uh, accessible story and it, it was able able to generate quite a lot of media interest and um, warnings. Mm. I'm just thinking about what you were saying earlier in communication and the difficulty of media and and one of the difficulties is that the media will bring in a family with an issue so in vaccination they'll bring in a family who says my child was was damaged by vaccinations in stem cells I can just imagine that they'll bring in a family who've gone to Cuba and had stem cells and they'll say, this child is much better from condition X, Y or Z. And that is so much more powerful than a person in a suit saying, this is a dangerous absolutely. and it's very, very hard so to, to... So what I, what, I, what I try to do is, um, I, over the years I've built up a fantastic relationship, again, really born from my work around lobbying with advocates. So um, I don't like and never roll someone out in a wheelchair for, for publicity. But what I do think is that they have a fantastic network. If I want to get my information out into their network, the best thing I can do is work with them to use their, um, their knowledge of what's, what's the, the issue in the community. Because I think with different diseases, different conditions, I need to tailor my message. Some vision loss areas, macular degeneration, are going to probably have treatments through clinical trials, so we'll know one way or the other, earlier than more complex conditions such as um, MND, motor neuron disease. So I work with patient advocate groups. Now that is also very powerful when it comes to media. So if I can't deliver the talent, I could ask one of my, I've got a, a couple of people who I work with who have long ago accepted their condition and, and in no way am I exploiting them, who are very happy to say, well, you know what, I just wouldn't do it. And them saying it is much more powerful than me saying it. Mm. Now, folks, I'm going to open up to questions in just a moment. So if you have them, um, get them ready. Um, we will have about another half hour of questions before we finish up the session. It, it is interesting, the sort of information that the public gets, though, and at some point they have to go seeking more. So a good example, you know, I'm, I'm a physicist, so I know nothing about medicine by default. That's why I now work in the medical faculty at Melbourne Uni. But, um, you know, there was this catalyst program recently on cholesterol some of you might have seen. Now, I have to say, I love my cheese. Um, and so watching this episode, suddenly I was reaching for more cheese. <laughs> and, you know, what I was really looking for was an appropriate forum to get information. What, what is the public supposed to, you know, highly educated scientist didn't know where to go, frankly. Um, you know, asked a few colleagues that I knew, got different opinions from different colleagues. What, what does the public have to do there? Where, Martin, I'll start with, with you. Where, where should they go? What should they do? Um, you must have a lot of cases where people, they see bits of information like this and they, they come to you for the miracle cure or for the alternative or, no, I don't have to take this medication anymore. I mean, wh where do they go? I mean, I think 
the first step is for, for the average person with a question like that is to talk to their GP you know, uh, or their cardiologist if they've got a cardiologist and they're about to stop taking their statins because of uh, Catalyst. Um, uh, I think that's the best way. I think the problem with the internet is that uh, there's some absolutely outstanding information on the internet but it's just as easy to put a, mm. a, a biased view an incorrect view on the internet and I think people can can get that view and uh, and, and so I think uh, talking to a trusted health professional is, is the first step. Mm. Can, can I just add, so, uh, so in, in my sociology research uh, with some colleagues out at Monash, we interviewed 16 people in our pilot study who'd gone overseas, uh, including some uh, parents of, who, had, who took their children away, so carers and, and, and people who had actually had treatment themselves. Now, what I found, because I, you know, had a preconceived idea about how the information chain went, and I thought it went something along the lines of, I saw an article in the media, in the newspaper, in the age, um, I, or I ran into somebody who had this treatment. I then perhaps went and talked to my GP, but I decided to go anyway. So that's how I thought it went. But the people we spoke to, that definitely wasn't the case. They might have seen a story in the newspaper. They might have just gone simply onto Dr. Google they then spoke and tracked down, did their research. They were very, very proactive. They were not, did not feel duped. They did not feel uninformed. They had done their research, but the research uh, consisted of finding someone through a chat room or finding someone who knew somebody who had a chat room. Now, that was very dangerous in my opinion because it was extrapolated. They didn't necessarily find someone who also had a child with cerebral palsy who was six. Um, they found someone who had had treatment for MS at this clinic. So, you know, not having direct comparables was one problem. And then they sought, sought medical advice from the provider, but didn't seem to be aware of the conflict of interest that they were selling this treatment. So, um, the final point I was gonna make is that almost universally, they were disenfranchised from the medical system here in Australia and very angry. Mm. So they were pissed off and, and frustrated. And again, back to my comment, had finally found someone who understood them and who could help. So mm. it's kind of like a messiah thing that, that they, they felt and they, they protected the provider. Even if they hadn't had the result they expected, they were pleased they'd had op the opportunity to do it. Mm. Um, uh, and I think that's certainly, yeah, if yeah. I can just interject my experience, and often patients who I've known for years and have very good relationships with will come in and say, I went and did it. Um, and I didn't want to talk to you beforehand because I knew you'd say not to do it. And, uh, and so it's, it's very understandable that, that uh, you know, I say, well, unfortunately for your condition, there's nothing uh, that we can offer that can uh, improve the outcome in the long term. Yep. Uh, we can do this, this and this to help along the way, but there's no treatments uh, that will slow the progression, et cetera, et cetera. They talk to this person in whatever country who says, we've had incredible results and their testimonies on the websites and it's, it's absolutely understandable how, and, and how, I, how that would yeah. And that again, impact. I think patient testimonials on the website, but I was gonna say that, that I'm, I, I all have also spoken to people who've had not the experience they wanted, but did not want to participate in our study. So I think our study was quite biased to those who did have, have um, a positive experience. And we actually called the study Hopeful Journeys because hope, the role of hope, I think, is the unrecognized champion here. And whether that equates to the placebo effect, you know, mm -hmm. um, giving people hope. And I see my role sometimes very much in the role of, 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 of the, the, the manner of having to manage people's expectations, not taking away their hope, keeping their hope in medical research alive, but perhaps trying to warn against cures. But it's, I think it's effective with some people in my experience, but others mm. will, aren't prepared to listen to that. Now, well, as we, um, we you know, look around the city these days, it's very hard to find a location, a house that isn't connected to the internet. So despite vast you know, differences in socioeconomic status, um, essentially everyone has information at their fingertips these days. Do we have to be careful in the way we put information out um, relative to those different SES categories because uh, and the statins example is a good one I mean one reason why I might want to go off my statins is because I really can't afford it if you give me a second reason done I mean, how, how do we deal with that aspect 
Yeah, it's it's difficult because obviously, as you say, pretty much everybody has that mm. now, and you know, everybody's you know in Geelong we have a lot of social deprivation, but I'm sure that if you drive around the socially deprived subject uh, uh, suburbs, you'd be able to find people with you know the latest iPhone on a contract or something mm. uh, downloading with their limitless gigabytes of data that they get per month with their contract, um, and uh, so it is difficult and. It is, that's why I just keep saying it's, it's so important for us to get out there. And talking about the media as well, as I, you know, I've only dealt with the media very briefly, but it, the, that having that filter of the media and the media wanting to spin things into um, a more exciting story. I mean, it happened to be just the other day for, on a flyer for a talk that I was doing. The media comms person, I'd approved the text that was going on it and the text was in the present tense and then when it came out, it was in the past tense. And I went, no, and I got a phone call from the person on the ethics committee at Bowen Health rang me and said, have you already done that study? And I'm like, no, it's going through ethics. You know that. I haven't got a, you know, it's still, it's still, you know, I'm still looking for an extract of maggot somewhere. Um, and, you know, it caused me problems and it, mm. it leaves you with a credibility gap. And so it is important that we do our own communication a lot of the time so that there is no misunderstandings. And, and I know that the, the power of the anecdote does sometimes win. Um, and as I say, as a parent of a child with autism, you know, I can't tell you how many people have wasted their time getting metal chelation therapy because they think their child's been poisoned with mercury. And you're like, I haven't been in vaccines since Australia for years. You know, but it makes them feel better. And they drive to Goulburn and they spend like, you know, 600 bucks. And you're just like, oh. mm. so, but is that necessary? Folks, I'm going to hand over to yourselves. Uh, yeah. Gentlemen up the, the back. Sorry, just please. here for a minute. We have a microphone coming up. Oh, yep. Great. Um, oh. um, I was just wondering with that, like, if there's uh, a problem with, because we probably don't like the idea of placebo effect and uh, the, the hope that, you know, treatments that probably don't have any observable actual benefit have, I'm wondering whether that actually causes a problem in that, that there's obviously a need there for people to have that thing of like, okay, even though I can't do anything, the feeling of doing something still makes me feel better, and that can actually have a positive effect. I, I'm just wondering whether that's something that educating people of like, okay, there's nothing, none of these treatments will have an observable effect, but if you want to do something, do this, because at least it won't have any harm, and have that not be like, you know, go do some things with crystals or something like that. Um, I. I think the power of hope is really important, and I think a placebo effect is not a bad thing. Thirty percent um, success rate. I, I, I don't. I don't think it's. Effect. I don't think it's a bad thing at all. Um, the problem is the risk, risk benefit, and and in in my area, the the risks are hu are real. The risks are real, and it's not as as simple as. Uh, and, and again, the people in our study said that uh, the 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 risk was perhaps doing their money, losing their money, um, yet. Almost all of them, even the children, had had lumbar punches. Yeah? And, and so who is making the risk-benefit analysis? My argument is that it should be the doctor providing the treatment who should have enough professional ethics to say, hmm, maybe this isn't in the, ch in the person's best interest. Yeah, I guess what I was trying to get at, if we promoted the fact that, you know, th those things are bad, so like, don't, don't, do, don't do a treatment that's definitely not going to have problems in that. But if you want to do something like, you know, drink more water or something like that, you know, at least have something that's like, actually do a placebo type thing, but don't do something crazy. Something. Mm. Yeah, I'm a big. I'm trying to get a license from the TJ for placebo mycin, which is a new antibiotic I've come up with, uh, and I'm trying to get the GPs to give it out. Yeah, placebo, would you like that? But uh, yeah, I'm hoping to get that license so that GPs can give it out to people with, uh, you know, respiratory tract viral infections, so that we can actually save some of the antibiotics for you guys when you need hips later. You're, you're going to make a fortune from that. Uh, I mean, I I absolutely agree with with that, but. If someone comes to me and says, I want to change my diet, and the diet they want to change to is healthier and not going to harm them, I'm all for it. The problem with this, I mean, yeah, the, the, a lot of this issue is generated by the Western medical tradition and the scientific method itself. The, the biggest and best example, and I've heard it a number of times, 
um, a friend of mine had a, a father who was dying of cancer, and the oncologist said, well, he's got about six, three to six months to live, and, 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 and my friend says, what do we do? And he said, well, we, we should put him through another regime mm. of, of chemotherapy. So what, this, what the med medical profession is saying, instead of letting this guy die because we can't do anything for him, we're going to torture him until he's dead. And well, I, I would hope that that's not the case. That she says, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take my father to my local um, remedial therapist and adjust his chakras and you'll feel better. So it's not, it's not a trivial matter, you know, it's a big deal and, and the Western medical profession is causing a lot of problems. That, that, that may, may or may not be the case. I mean, uh, hopefully a good doctor would say, we can give this treatment and these are the risks and benefits and you might have an extra few weeks, months, but the, the downside is you might have um, worse quality of life during that time. And allow people There's to a lot to make of people that are doing it choices. for their own fine. A lot of Western medical doctors are doing it because there's a financial incentive. That's the only thing I can explain. So, certainly, um, the, the one thing that has to be said there is that um, anything we do should be evidence based. I mean, I, I, as a scientist, if you bring something to me and you can't give me evidence for it, I put it into the same category as religion. That's how I think. But I'm a trained scientist, right? That's how I think. If we go with non-evidence-based things, that's fine, and, and I think people should be well and truly happy to go and utilise them, but don't come back and ask for the evidence later when they don't work. Um, if, if it's evidence-based, you get that up front before you go in. And sometimes, and so I'll take your point, is a good one, sometimes the outcome is not a good one. And I, I, I agree with you that I think that person made the right choice in not going down that, that difficult path when the the risks are probably, or the chances of recovery are so low. But as, as with... The, it's the Western medical tradition that is causing a lot of these communication mm. problems. And, and, and I think we, we, can, we can agree there are a number of things on Western medicine, but the fact that we're not all dying at the age of 25, as we would otherwise be, is, is part of that. So I, I want to give everyone a chance to say a few things, though. We have another question up yeah, at the back um, In the war between anecdotes and evidence, the anecdotes win every time. It's a good example of using anecdotes for an, evidence, for an, for an argument. Um, just as an aside, I heard Paul Willis speak last week at a convention, and uh, very disappointingly, the ABC was pretty wrapped in the ratings they got from that Staten story. Um, just getting back to the, the, the anecdotes and, and the, um, the talent, I'm just wondering, should science educators, sort of an ethical issue here, be using anecdotes more often on the kind of good side? I'm, I'm thinking, say, of the, the Stop the, Austra the AVN movement and the Australian skeptics who kind of use the McCaffreys in a fairly positive sort of way uh, as an example of the evidence. However, um, you know, is that ethical to be picking um, anecdotes as your evidence? Yeah, I think it, uh, if you saw Sonia Pemberton's jabbed program that came out um, this year on SBS, that was heavily um, backed by science scientists in Australia and um, they had the families there as well and they had I think some families from the US and they're remaking it at the moment for the US market because it was so, it had such good impact for basically using anecdotes but for the, the force of vaccination as a good thing rather than a bad thing and so I think there definitely is a role for that and if there is this these kind of um, sort of multidisciplinary approaches where they actually use where you know scientists pretty much we're not great at communicating, most of us. <laughs> um, but that's because we've sort of got our minds in the lab and not on how to market things. But having anecdotes are always very personal. And I usually use my personal experience. As I said, I've sat, sat up here and talked about my son and talked about being a mother or a carer of someone with a disease. Um, and so people relate to that really well. And so if you can use that, and I remember when the jabbed program came out, I was having some vociferous argument on Twitter with several other people about um, you know, vaccine injuries. And I said, well, my son's got autism and I don't think for one minute that it was caused by his MMR vaccination, vaccination or any of his vaccinations. You know, I think it's probably neurobiological and some sort of genetic basis because his dad and his granddad are a bit dodgy too. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's just, it, it's really difficult. But I think there is a role to play for that. But I think jab definitely had a mix of the science in a, communicated in a really good way. I think Gus Nossel did a really good 
thing and they had a fabulous animation of how the immune system works that I use in my uh, medical biotech lectures today um, to my students to show them to try and communicate the, these concept of how the immune system works and how it fights disease. But they they interspersed that with those um, you know in depth stories of a family with a child with the, either with the disease or they had a baby with whooping cough and they, in the children's I think it was and it was just awful that this tiny baby with whooping cough and you could hear it and it's just not something we see anymore mm. because you know it's just not our experience anymore and so you know you talk to someone who's like 80 and they're like I don't remember people dying of you know having to have braces of the legs from polio and stuff like that but now because it's been so successful in the interim that people coming through are like oh it's not a problem anymore mm. you know the, the, the focus on the way we communicate things is incredibly powerful in the public mind. Uh, I remember as a physicist, I was quite amazed in my early career by a, a new piece of technology that was developed called a nuclear magnetic resonance imaging machine. Of course, we dropped the end because people didn't want to put their head in that. <laughs> it's amazing now it works without the nuclear part. Um, of course, the, the message there is very powerful, though. The word nuclear was extremely dirtied in my field, um, and, and tragically so. And so having that word on something in a medical context uh, is not good, and, and we have to be mindful of that. There's a question up the back. Uh, back to the statins program. I always watched Catalyst, and I, I, for some reason, have a lot of faith in it. And then I saw that statins program, and I accepted what they told me, but then I saw the Media Watch program that followed mm. it, where he tore it to pieces. You know, the three independent witnesses had actually written a book together. They were all selling naturopathic remedies for, and, and he really, you know, ripped it apart. Now that's destroyed Catalyst for me. It might be a good thing that I question every time I see Catalyst, but it's, it's, you know, how do you feel about that, you people? The, the, the fact that this normally expected to be rational, responsible, scientific program has suddenly not <laughs> lost its credibility, mm. yes. Mm. Can we come in, Nikki? Uh, I just, um, I suppose Catalyst, I think, like a lot of, um, I, 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 I have found that they're, the way they present the science in my field can be quite tabloid. It's a small, it's a short, a short media format, and and often again to get the message across, it's redacted and it loses it. And, and the other comment I was going to make about the statin story, I think Norman Swan should be congratulated for standing up and from being a, cri a critic within house, mm. and uh, that's great to see. Great mm. to see. And I guess m my comment is, if you see something on television or in the paper that has one side of a story that is the opposite to convention then you have to really start asking questions. Why aren't we hearing another side? Uh, why aren't we getting opinions from others? Um, and and that, that, those were certainly the alarm bells when I saw that uh, Catalyst show. Mm. Because well, it's not an area I know the data on per se. Yeah. One, one of the things I found interesting about the response to Catalyst, and you know, as you can imagine there on Triple R, I've had a lot of people ask me of my opinion on that. And if you go into that program thinking, they have made a selection as to which side they're on before they started filming, then actually it was a very good program. It was very well put together. Um, but, but don't go in, in the, under the illusion that, that the question was still being asked during the program. Um, the question had been well and truly asked and answered before they started the program. So they'd chosen a side. Now, the unfortunate thing about that is that we would like to think that programs like Catalyst are investigative journalism in which case they go after questions. And, and there is absolutely no reason why you, know, you shouldn't investigate these things. I mean, this is how paradigm shifts occur in every science. You, you shouldn't just leave them be because they've been around for long enough. That's not the way science works. It's not the way it progresses. But that's not what we got when we, when we watched Catalyst, which is, I think, why people responded in, in the way that they did. Question down the front. Hi. Um, Ben Goetzel came down um, a couple of years ago and in, in his talk about ageing and that sort of thing, he, he did a little segment on um, chronic fatigue syndrome. He had done a study um, using his artificial intelligence to study a small group um, who had the symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome 
and he had found out, I think it was in 2006 or something, that um, there, were, there were these slight mutations on things that, that involved with um, the genes to do with the brain and the immune system and that sort of thing. And I had not heard about it until I actually went to that. And I, no doctor I've been to has heard about it as far as I know. In fact, you, you're often treated like you're a malingerer or a hypochondriac. And um, it, it, how, how does that actually, those sort of things get out? Because I have been told by doctors, oh, you know, there is no proof for this, there is no evidence. And they looked at it on the basis of artificial intelligence. It could look at the genes a lot more deeply and precisely than the human eye could look at. And it's just, it's not out there in the media and it's not out there with doctors. Doctors don't seem to know about it. And it obviously needs a lot more studying, but the, there's not the money there, obviously, to do it. But it was, it was a proper study done in conjunction with the CDC. But people don't seem to know about it. And I never would have found out if I hadn't have gone to like a, a science conference. So mm. what, what do you think about that? And how things get to doctors and the public? So I think there's a few issues of what you've brought up. One is about communication. Another is about cause and effect. Uh, I think one of the problems with conditions like chronic fatigue, like autism, is there's not one cause for these things. Mm -hmm. There's many, many different causes. Uh, and so, for example, in autism, uh, we now know that there are particular genetic alterations in that are identifiable now in about 20%. Unfortunately, I sent my son's stuff to you guys and you didn't find anything, but I'll send it back in 15 years. I was going to say, <laughs> maybe not even in 15, maybe in, you know, Five? when we do okay. whole genome sequencing, once awesome. that comes in, okay. then we'll unquestionably <laughs> pick up another 20, 30, okay. who knows what percentage. Um, and how, how does the message get through to doctors is that mm. it's up to... It's the specialists in the area to communicate yeah. it when they give talks. Yeah. Yeah, GPs read particular literature yeah. and so get it through yeah. that way, um, through letters back back from specialists. Um, and again, I think but it's another form of communication. It's a critical form is yeah. is uh, getting these advances I mean, through I, to the... I teach medical students. I teach medical students genetics, in fact. Um, two weeks is all they get yeah. in the first year. Um, there is no time and the people coming into medicine now as a postgraduate course, they can have done anything. In fact, we've got someone, I can't believe we've got someone at Deakin that did their first degree in naturopathy. Okay, I found that out this year and just shook my head and wanted to cry. But, you know, you can come in from engineering, you can come in from arts law, you can come in from any subject. As long as you can learn the GAMSAT and pass the GAMSAT and have a really good mark in whatever you do, including naturopathy, um, you can become a doctor. And you then come to our department and we then spend two years teaching you, trying to teach you everything that you need to know to underpin your knowledge with some basic science. And it becomes reductionist in the way that um, we teach genetics. And um, we basically can't teach them anything more than what you would, what I think I learned at almost year 12 you know, genetics, and so the genetics is moving so fast, as you mm. say. And all of my students say, well, what do we do if, we've, if we're a GP and someone comes and speaks to us? I was like, you have to refer them to a genetic counselling service. Mm. There are specialists now. And so, you know, medicine is so massively complicated to learn within four years that doctors have become basically just a conduit to send people to other specialists that actually can give them the answers. And so if you expect that you're going to get detailed answers from your GP, you may be mistaken. You will need to then say, well, OK, you're not giving me the information that I require. Can you please refer me to someone who may have more of an idea? I think part of it is they don't know about it. Yeah. But with your case, I would say, if I was the G your GP, I would say, right, I don't know. I've not heard of that. I don't know anyone's heard of that. But I will refer you to the clinical. I'll refer you to Martin. Yeah. I'll, send you, I'll send you down to the the genetic counsellor, and they can trawl, they might know some literature. If there is any, they would know about it. I yeah, want to get to a last couple of questions before, we, business, thank before you. we finish. But, um, you know, there's, there's a phrase, seek a, seek a second opinion. It's there for a reason. <laughs> Didn't just pop up. Um, 
just in here. Do you think there's a role in continuing professional development for scientists yes. to yes. Um, to take on social media professional training, um, um, engaging with the media, maybe even lobbying? I mean, the, the way climate scientists have come together over the last few years, not that it's had much of an effect, especially in this country, um, <laughs> but it still represents quite a, a sound model that might address some of the issues that you guys are struggling with. At me, they're looking at me as the Twitter lady. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, I think that that's true. And I'm lucky that I'm at Deakin. We're actually being forced to do it at Deakin. Okay, so we've got something that's Orwellian. It's very Orwellian in its name, called Deakin Live the Future Agenda. <laughs> and, it, and Live stands for something, but I can't remember what it is. Shh, don't tell. Shh, don't tell the vice chancellor. I've forgotten what it stands for. Um, but uh, basically, we have now built into our course, and we're doing a course enhancement process at the moment to make sure that digital literacy is embedded with that for our students. And guess what? If you're the lecturer and you have to teach digital literacy to your students, you better know some, you know, mm. because they obviously can be a bit more savvy than your average sort of prof professorial with a beard kind of guy. Um, and so it definitely behooves, behooves us to learn it and to teach it to our students. And it comes back, I, I, the first... Uh, tutorial I do in my introduction to medical biotechnology is the sort of apprentice uh, gag tutorial where I give them a list of links about the MMR vaccine and ask them to find the evidence base uh, from the websites that I've found. And, you know, it's a bit like sending an apprentice down to, you know, find checkered paint or a left-handed screwdriver. It's sort of the <laughs> academic equivalent of that. And you send them off to the AVN website and say, can you find me the evidence for those 10 claims that they've made about vaccinations causing injuries? And they're like, no, 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 we can't. There's no links, there's no evidence, no nothing. And I'm like, yes. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Can, can yeah, I just maybe? have just yep. a burning point to add to that, though? I think it's really important, and I think we need to encourage our, our young scientists kind of to be, you know, to be activists to some extent, but in their area. And I think that's the thing, that, that, that you know, there is no such thing as a stem cell specialist. Um, we use stem cells in different facets of research. And what I try to do with media inquiries in, in my role is to feed them out. So sometimes it's appropriate that, that my boss comments, but other times it's appropriate somebody in WA comments who has specialty in, in liver cancer stem cells, for example. Mm -hmm. So I try to fuel and, and feed those inquiries because... I do mm. think, um, back to your point earlier about the comms team at the universities, they also have a big role in this, in that a lot of scientists get very frustrated and want to, yeah. not very pleased with the press release that comes I out. I just get to the point where I just do it myself now. Yeah. It's just... I do too. Cut out the middleman, cut out the middleman who has no science training and doesn't understand, you know, that scientists are very cautious with language when they're making statements and don't make sweeping statements and generalisations. And don't necessarily want to be polarised black white. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> you know, we, I know, you know people get bored with this hedging, but you know, we really sometimes have to hedge unless the overwhelming evidence points in one direction, such as climate science or vaccination. You know, some of those things where people still are going, well, there's two sides for every story. You're going, well, yes, but it's sort of 99% this way. You know, it's sort of biased towards the scientific opinion. Well, in this case. We have time for just one more question here with the microphone. Um, that actually segues quite neatly into my burning question since the beginning of the talk. Um, we've talked a lot about middlemen, about the media, about comms teams, about the GPs or the specialists who are supposed to deliver the research to the patients. Um, Mel, you're on Twitter. Megan, you're on Twitter. Martin, I haven't found you on Twitter, but apparently it's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> So, Help. join us, Martin. <laughs> it's a cult. <laughs> um, so, I guess my question is, what are the the risks or the benefits, or or how do you feel about this this new world where anyone with any question can come and find you, and they can say, "Mate, you've got some medical maggots. I helped fund that research. Give me some yep. maggots." Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a great place to finish, actually. So, yeah. I'll, I'll get you to also just make this your final statement each of you, just for 30 seconds. Okay, so uh, being found by anyone in the world to ask me a question, I'm quite ha comfortable with that. And uh, it hasn't bitten me on the backside yet, but I've only been on Twitter since February, so there's still time. Um, and I've actually made some really good friends out of that, and I've actually linked people up 
and particularly talking about this is chronic fatigue thing, there's quite a lot of people that follow me that uh, have rickettsial diseases or Lyme disease type things, and that's still quite a controversial um, issue. But then I can point them into the direction, oh, uh, well, actually, we've got the rickettsial reference laboratory in Geelong. I will ask the expert and get back to you with some papers. You know, And so actually, it doesn't worry me because I'm quite happy to, as you say, point them into the direct in the direction of the people who would be the most expert to help them um, if I know who they are or at least you know I can do a 10 minute on PubMed and find something that if they don't have access again the open access problem can be an issue for people that are not academics because they may not have subscriptions to all of the journals to get information and so it's hard for them to go to the primary source a lot of the time and they're then having to get their information from filtered media comms jazzed up press releases, and so it can be very difficult. Thanks, Mel. Martin, I think the, the team here is actually getting you on Twitter as we speak. It should be done by the end of the session. <laughs> Comment? So I'll finish by saying I'm not on Twitter or Facebook, and I made a conscious decision not to do it because I'm so um, obsessed with emails and being distracted by electronics that I thought this would only make me completely incapable of sitting and writing a paper or anything like that but I'll be I might be convinced but I'll tell you a quick story that I think is an interesting one in terms of the v the views of the the medical world the first day I started at Austin Hospital in 2009 the first email I got was dear staff uh, we have banned Facebook I don't know that Twitter existed then mm -hmm because we told you that if the usage went up uh, we would ban it and the usage has doubled then about six months ago, I got an email saying, we have now recanted the ban because we think this is an uh, extremely important way of communicating with the world and with patients, and therefore uh, we think this is important to allow you to, to use, which I thought was a, a really or interesting... Thank you for the Austin. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I'll leave you with that uh, story. Yeah. So um, I do tweet, and I'm a, a late convert in that I only started really two two years ago. But uh, and I don't tweet under my own name. I, I I hide behind our logo and our Stem Cells Australia name. Um, but I have also formed excellent relationships, mm -hmm. predominantly with other sort of information yeah. providers, for want of a better word, in the mm -hmm. space. However, what I have done is I put a lot of effort into designing a standalone website that came out of the university kind of really, really set format and, and made it something that I, tr I tried to be very user friendly yeah, and have cool. information there to counter Dr. Google. Because I figured most people that I speak to are using Dr. Google. So I wanted to have a kind of user friendly website. And uh, featured on that website predominantly is contact us if you want more information. I don't use our phone number much, but I use our email. Yeah. And um, I don't know if, it's, if, if this is a large response, but over that two years, we've had 800 inquiries. And that's a lot for me. It's only me. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a lot to deal with. I do not give medical advice, but I do, I do like to personalise it. So I have a, you know, a, a, a standard template letter that I, I have for different conditions. And in amongst that message, topped and tailed is the same. I'm very sorry to hear about your suffering. We don't have, unfortunately, there is no proven treatment. And then at the bottom, I, I put out a very general warning about um, the risks of stem cell tourism and, and these unproven treatments and lack of evidence. And in the middle, I try to direct them, encourage them to the patient advocacy group that might have more information about how to live with the condition and also um, perhaps about clinical trials that are in that, that condition. So mm. that's kind of how I, how I deal with it. But I, we have a Facebook page as well, but I try to rely predominantly on our website, which I can kind of control. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Um, just to finish, I'd like to give you p two points. One, one is that we, we, need in the, we need to get the public to do this more in general, to see science as a living, breathing, changing, evolving beast. Um, don't ever go in thinking that you have the final and only answer from science that you read. That's not the way science works. And it's often the perception people have of science, and it's particularly problematic. The second point is that Scientists are generally not trained to communicate. About 95 to 97% of the communicating they do does not involve the media or the public. So it's only a very, very small optional part that they, they actually engage with that would get out to the public. And they're typically not trained for that. It's extremely high risk and low return for them. And yet it's what sets the mindset of our population in terms of the science they do. 
This is one of the biggest problems I see. I think it's something we've got to overcome. We've got to get our scientists themselves, and I take your point of the direct interaction, talking more and more to the public in public forums and so forth so that the public hears from people directly as to the research they do. Please join me in thanking our three panellists who I think have done a fabulous job. There is a break now. I understand the next presentation is back in here at 5 p.m. Thank you. Thanks very much, Shane Huntington, Melanie, Megan, and Martin for such a wonderful triple panel. M. Triple M. Yeah, Triple M. That's right. Three M's. Thanks very much, guys, for spending your time to come and talk to us today. It's been a pleasure having you.